give me your name and spell your last name and give me your, your former position. Uh, Robert L. Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, former Justice of the Fifth District Court of Appeal. It's my pleasure today to be talking with retired Associate Justice Robert L. Martin of the Court of Appeal, Fifth Appellate District. My name is Steve Vardabedian, and I am an Associate Justice of that same court here in Fresno. As a part of the centennial of the California Courts of Appeal, the Appellate Court Legacy Project Committee is creating an oral history of our appellate courts and their justices. Good morning, Bob, and thank you for your participation. Good morning. Good to see you. Now, are we going to call each other Bob and Steve? I think that works I think okay. I'll be more comfortable with that. I, I think that's a very comfortable way to do it. And uh, Bob, you, you served 20 years as a jurist, uh, 15 of, of those years here on the Court of Appeal. And most appear, attorneys appearing before you have described you as a tough, no-nonsense judge. Yet there is a side of you that, that many attorneys may not have seen, that some of us have seen, uh, that you are an engaging, hospitable man, actually a man with quite a talent for cooking. Uh, we'll get to, into that later on and talk about that a little bit. But first, let's talk about some of your younger years, and then we'll go into your uh, legal and judicial uh, career. Certainly. Uh, as I understand it, you were born in San Francisco in 1929, and that you grew up uh, in Vallejo. Uh, as a youngster, uh, was there any particular person that had a great influence on you, or persons that, that had a great influence on you growing up? Well, I don't, I didn't thought you were going to ask me something that far back, but um, <laughs> Uh, probably the, the person who had the most influence on me in the high school, by the time I reached the high school era, was a Miss Letson. In those days, lots of uh, teachers, uh, women teachers, were unmarried. And she was the um, uh, counselor for our grade. Um, and I don't know, I remember that, uh, I, you know, in my mind, of trying to figure out what I was going to do and this sort of thing. And we, and we came from a very poor family, blue-collar worker. And uh, I would go and talk to her during uh, study hall. And uh, she, she not only gave me some good advice, she uh, sort of caused me to think outside the box, if, if that's appropriate to this discussion. And anyway, she... I made a long story out of one that could have been very short. Miss Letson was sort of a, a mentor to that extent. Plus, um, one of our, um, uh, in those days they called it social studies, which was sort of hist historical, uh, that sort of thing. And sh she was, I don't know why I focused on the women teachers, but uh, uh, she and her husband sort of befriended me and uh, was uh in retrospect, you know, an influence on me. Do you think that the uh, social studies course, those kinds of things, that did they help develop aspirations towards maybe law? Did, did that have any effect, do you think? You know, I don't know why I decided I wanted to be a lawyer, but somewhere along the line, by the time I was 12 or 13, I, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I'm not sure I knew what a lawyer did, but I wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, as an example, my father was a machinist on Mare Island. I'd been there for many, many years. And when I got to be uh, 16 and a half or so, he, uh, I guess he waited till my mother was out in the yard or out of the room or whatever one time, and he said, uh, it, they called me Robert. He said, Robert, uh, did you ever think about uh, going to work on Mare Island as an apprentice? And I think he, the way he put it was, you know, you'll not make a lot of money, but you'll always have job security and a paycheck. And I said, well, Dad, um, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I want to be a lawyer. And I think figuratively his jaw dropped a little. And he says, well, uh, Robert, you know, we don't have any money. And I said, well, I know, but uh, I'll figure a way. And uh, he says, well, I'll help you all I can. But he was sort of... Uh, overwhelmed is probably overstating, but much surprised by my comments in that respect. Sort of an old school, hard working guy. That oh yes, oh yes. You worked with your hands and highly, uh, that kind very of thing. highly respected within the family. Whenever anyone had a problem, uh, I think the same was, well, let's go talk to Leslie. Mm -hmm. But uh, at any rate, I just had the idea that I wanted to be a lawyer and I, I, I got a, 
a uh, library card. I found out about the libraries at school. And I got a library card by the time I was about 9 or 10 and started reading. And uh, I don't know, it just all came together. So reading was something that you, at a very young age, mm -hmm. uh, had a great interest in. Never, uh, never uh, lost it. Never lost it. Another thing that you've never lost is your, your uh, interest in cooking. Did that start at a young age also? <laughs> well, uh, yes, I love to cook. Uh, I give my mom credit for that because uh, she was an old-fashioned uh, gal uh, in the sense that she didn't have rest cookbooks or this sort of thing. Uh, they cooked because their mother told them, well, you put a handful of this and a pinch of that, I guess, or whatever. And then right by the time I was seven or eight, uh, she would uh, say, you want to cook your breakfast this morning? And so I would, she'd stand behind me or be close, and I would cook it, you know, and uh, I loved it. I still do. And we'll talk about that a little bit later sure. on. But let's get back to your, your younger days. Uh, uh, at Vallejo High School, did you have any particular interest or extracurricular activities that you uh, t took? Well, football, of course. Okay. Played uh, two years of high school football, and um, uh, thinking of something where we're talking. Oh, uh, I, they didn't have forensics at my school, but they had public speaking, and uh, I don't know. I really enjoyed public speaking. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that served you well in your career. Oh, yeah. But I was thinking, well, you know, I, I think I was just a typical high school kid. Uh, you know, a little interested in everything, but not totally focused on anything. Now, I understand you also, uh, after graduation from high school, you attended uh, junior colleges uh, in the Bay Area. Well, at Vallejo. Vallejo, Col Vallejo, Vallejo College. Vallejo Junior College. Vallejo Junior College. They, don't, they didn't call them community colleges then. Oh, okay. They were junior colleges after junior World College. War II. Uh, did you have your uh, career kind of planned out at that point? Were you thinking in terms of law, or were you more general in your, in your Well, thinking? I was thinking in terms of law if I could get through college, Okay. which I never did. I got uh, about two and a half years in, and uh, by that time my dad had retired. I, w I was adopted, and my parents were in their middle 30s when they got me. Uh, so by the time I was out of high school, uh, they were in their middle 50s. In other words, not the typical 43 or 4 or 5 year old parents, you know. So at any rate, uh, my dad had retired and there was absolutely no money. So I had to leave school and go to work. Needless to say, within six months, Korea started and they got drafted. So I never got back until after uh, the Army. So between going to work and your military service, that kind of caused a detour in your plans. A little to, bit, to say a little delay. Uh, how, how did that military experience from 1950 to 1952, how did that affect you? Well, I didn't, I didn't like the Army. There was nothing wrong with the Army. Uh, I just didn't want to be in the Army because I had started what I thought was a beginning career. By that time, law school was in the back of my mind. Uh, started a beginning career in banking with Bank of America and uh, I was in a hurry to get out of the Army and get back to that and uh, what happened was I spent my two years in the Army and, and got out and then a friend of mine uh, from school uh, Saul Tiberval to be exact uh, well I was in he was married and had a had a child um, while I was in the Army, he had started going, we lived in Vallejo, he had started going to night law school in San Francisco. And as soon as I got out of the Army and we got back in touch, I said, what an opportunity, because by then I had the GI Bill. So I went to four years of night law school, which the GI Bill paid, I think, about the first three years. And, uh, and of course, I worked full time during the day. Uh, those, what didn't seem possible two or three years earlier, worked out. Yeah, I, I've talked to other people who went to school during your time and also served in military service. Was it that you could um, start law school without having gotten a, a bachelor's degree if you had served in the military service? Yes, Was that because a way to do it? they gave you credit for the military <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in, in the sense of 
you're older, more mature, and uh, in their view, had a more firm uh, idea in terms of what you wanted to do career-wise and all. In other words, I guess they weighed it and said, okay, uh, this is good enough to offset uh, not having the bachelor's. So it's, it's the mid-1950s. Uh, you're attending a, a law school at night. I took yes. the four-year program. Was it at Lincoln University there in San Francisco? Yes. And uh, you're working for Bank of America as a trust officer? Is well, that, is that what you're doing started also? off in, in Vallejo, of course, mm -hmm. uh, out of the service. And uh, once I started going to night law school, or a few months after, they re review uh, all the employees' records for changes and one thing or another. And they picked up in San Francisco that I was now going to night law school in San Francisco, three nights a week back and forth. And so they transferred me to the trust department in San Francisco. And that all of a sudden made it much easier. What, what was the city of San Francisco like in those days? Uh, that's before my time. I was a young child then. I didn't <laughs> see much of San Francisco. What was it like? Uh, oh, it was a... It was a fun place to live, uh, sort of, well, certainly for someone coming from Vallejo. Uh, it, was, it was an exciting place to live, you know. Uh, uh, it was just, it was a little early for the, um, um, what, what do they call the kids, uh, the flower, flower kids. Uh, there's another word I can't that, think that's, of. That's my uh, era in the late yeah. 60s, the yeah. flower children. Uh, uh, it was a little was early for that, but the, they had some of the, the poets and you know lots of things going on. It was a fun place to live, and I lived in what they called a guest house, which was like a like a whole, it was more like a boarding house. Uh, you had your own room and bath, and you had a bath if you could afford a room with a bath. Otherwise, you had a bath down the hall, um, and you got two meals a day: breakfast and dinner, six days a week, for a fixed price, and. Um, for someone new to the city uh, and a bachelor, it was uh, it was fun to live there too, because it was co-education, co-ed, you know. So it was very interesting. I imagine that was a lot of fun. Yeah, um, that's where so I met my wife, Jean. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When, when, when did when did you get married? Uh, was it during uh, this time period? Or yeah, 1956. Okay. I think it was 1956. Okay, then uh, you, you graduated from law school and you, you become admitted to the bar in 1959. Right. What, what brought you to uh, Fresno at that time? Jean was <clears throat> from Fresno. Oh, okay. She was from Fresno and her parents were gone, but uh, her brother and his wife and their two children lived here. Uh, she was Italian, Natalie, and uh, uh, I liked Fresno. You know, it seemed like there'd be a neat place to live. So I came down here on a trust case, um, appeared in court, and after court, uh, the attorney who represented the trust uh, took me over and introduced me to Clark Savory, who was the district attorney then. And um, we talked for a couple of minutes, and I said I was in San Francisco, married to uh, uh, a Fresno girl, and I'd really like to, uh, by this time we had two children, really like to uh, uh, move down to Fresno. Did he have any uh, uh, opportunities in the district attorney's office? He said, well, let me take your name and number. Um, so he pulled out his phone book, and on the cover of his phone book were like 150 names and telephone numbers scribbled in all different directions and everything. So I gave him my name and telephone number at the bank thinking, forget this, I'll never hear from him again. And um, that was a Friday. Two weeks to the later on the, on, a fr on the Friday, two weeks of the day, I was sitting at my desk in the bank talking to the vice president about a, tr about a, a state. And the phone rang and uh, I answered the phone and, and the person on the other end said, this is Savory, you still want a job? And I said, uh, I was good able to connect it up and knew who it was without giving things away to the vice president. And I said, uh, yeah. He says, two weeks notice enough? I said, yeah, I suppose so. He says, okay, see you two weeks from Monday and hung up. 
Dr. Savory, very brief and to the point, right. wasn't he? So <laughs> on the basis of that, I, uh, it was just before noon, so I went out and walked up and down Montgomery Street for an hour instead of having lunch. I thought, okay, so I went back and resigned from the bank on the basis of that telephone call. I, I think today the Fresno County District Attorney's Office has something like 110 attorneys. I believe so. Uh, at that time, about how many attorneys were in the office? There were 10 uh, attorneys and one assistant. So it's grown but, tenfold. Uh, but, <laughs> but I was going to tell you time. one final note on the, the hiring. When I got down here two weeks later on Monday, at first he didn't remember me. So I was thinking, what am I going to do now? But he, then he remembered me and, and in his inimical way said, walk down the hall till you see an empty office. <laughs> at any rate, I didn't mean to interrupt the Oh, chain not of an thought. interruption at all. That's uh, all a part of uh, uh, the way Clark Savory was and the way he, he operated the DA's office in here in Fresno. Uh, so you, I guess, uh, worked there for about four years. Did you enjoy being a prosecutor? Anything in particular? Oh, yes, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, about three and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the opportunity with the firm came up. But uh, when you went to work in the DA's office in those days, irrespective of background, experience, or whatever, you started as a junior uh, deputy DA. And I think the pay was like $405 a month. That's 1960. So even then, that was pretty bad. But uh, one thing about... Uh, Clark, um, as soon as he had the opportunity and, and the <coughs> position available in the office, assuming he wanted to keep you, and, and he was very good about that, get everybody a very, very good chance, uh, he promoted you to senior deputy district attorney, and I think he made a jump from 400 to about 650 or something in like overnight. So that puts you back on the on the situation where you could at least pay your rent and buy groceries. That's a pretty good percentage increase anyway, isn't it? <laughs> Very good. So uh, at that time, and you mentioned uh, the law firm uh, opportunity came up for you, uh, and f of course uh, the firm uh, Wild Christensen, which has undergone a lot of different names and still is in existence today, a very uh, venerable law firm in this town. Uh, was it a matter that that firm take, took note of you as, as uh, handling cases in the DA's office? How was it that you came, uh, became acquainted with uh, those folks and were interviewed by them in, in 1964? Well, the, um, the firm was Wild Christensen, Carter, and Blank. And the Blank was Arthur Blank. Uh, but Bob Carter was, was the primary trial lawyer in the firm and uh, handled some criminal as well as civil. And I got to know him, became acquainted with him, and he had a brother, George Carter, who was quite well known uh, in the community as a uh, criminal defense lawyer. At any rate, I got acquainted with Bob, tried a couple cases with him, again, me one side, he on the other. <coughs> and uh, I started making hints about I would uh, be interested in getting out of the DA's office and going to his firm would be very acceptable. So I sort of pushed it a little. But it worked. And, and it and worked, and they invited me in. And they, they invited you in. And, you know, uh, when you look at the, uh, uh, that particular firm, uh, it reads like a who's who in, in Fresno uh, legal, circle, legal circle, some of the partners you served with. And a number of them, like you, uh, became judges. Uh, was there anyone in particular who mentored you at, at the firm? That, that Bob Carter. Refer to? Bob Carter. If anyone, Bob Carter. Mm -hmm. And what was the nature of your practice once you got there? The litigation. I went into litigation, and he and I worked together for the next uh, 13, 14 years. Any particular memorable cases that you would wish to share with us? Oh, I, I don't have any reluctance, but, uh, uh, you know, I don't, re don't really think of any particular outstanding case at the moment. Uh, but, we did, you know, we did a little of anything, and we represented, uh, the firm represented a few uh, semi-large uh, businesses. Uh, well, we kept busy, had lots of work, but uh, if I can't, the only, the biggest case I can remember is the one in which I didn't participate when Bob and George uh, represented this, uh, he also was a lawyer, uh, Mark, can't think of what it was, he was 
uh, accused of trying to buy off the city attorney. Was it Mark Stefano? Mark Stefano. I couldn't think of his name. And um, it was all over the papers at the time. You were probably still pretty young. But uh, they ultimately took the case up and tried it in, um, let's see, Oakland's Alameda County. In Alameda County. And they ended up trying it before a very well-known judge in California, Sparky Avedigian. Do you remember the Spar name? Sparky Avakian. Avakian, I'm yeah. sorry. And they tried the case before him and won the case. Got him, got Mark acquitted. And there was a, um, a real estate person also charged in the indictment. And, the, and he ended up getting convicted. But uh, that was... The more one of the more exciting things that was going on. Uh, other than that, you know, nothing, nothing that just all of a sudden overwhelms everything else. Looking back, is there anything uh, in your law practice that you think particularly well prepared you to become a judge? Well, I uh, had lots of litigation experience, and uh, although in the DA, well, you don't try civil stuff. I had gone from the district attorney's office to the firm, and there I had tried mostly civil litigation, uh, everything from personal injury to breach of contract to, you know, almost anything you, you can think of. So in that respect, I felt generally well-founded, you know, in, in a position where at least I didn't have to be scared. Well, I was anyway, but uh, in the beginning, but, uh, you know, that I was going to be able to uh, uh, handle the business at hand. I think we all have that fear at first. Uh, oh, yes, we, I we, know. We get I into know. our jobs uh, eventually. Uh, at this time, did you become involved in any uh, civic or political organizations, uh, those kinds of services? Well, I was active in the Bar Association, of course. Um, and I um, was Law Day chairman for three or four years. And, um, oh, I can't remember which president it was. Uh, at any rate, uh, this was in the days where... Uh, they were beginning to create these public service firms, you know, like Legal Services, Inc. and Fresno. Well, the, uh, the bar appointed a committee, and I was on the committee uh, to, con to consider the uh, possibility of Fresno creating a, uh, a legal service firm for the, uh, the, I don't like to say poor people, but the people who couldn't otherwise afford legal services and that sort of thing. So we uh, worked on it for several months and put it together and, and uh, formed Fresno Legal Services, Inc. And I was on the first board of directors. Uh, there were six or seven of us uh, who did that. And uh, that was a very rewarding and, and uh, enjoyable experience. I got involved with the Junior Chamber of Commerce soon after I came to Fresno because several of the guys in the district attorney's office were in the JCs, and uh, I really enjoyed that, and I um, be became uh, what they call state director, and then I became uh, first vice president and president of the JCs over a period of about three or four years. And that was very enjoyable, and it also helped me become a little better known. You know, by this time I was in private practice, and uh, you know you're looking for client sources in those circumstances. And, uh, oh, I was a member, or no, I was on the board of directors of, uh, uh, what's what the primary charitable deal in Fresno, the, the all the charities together, they had the big... United Way? I was on that? the board of directors of United Way for a couple of years. And I was on the board of directors and, and was president of the Volunteer Bureau that's that's pretty much it, the, the things that immediately come to mind. At uh, some point in time, did you either express an interest or did you hear from the governor's office that you were being considered for a, a judicial appointment? No, it was my idea. Nobody okay, <laughs> well, tell us about that. <laughs> uh, well, I guess after I had, when I became a lawyer or when I was in the process of becoming a lawyer, it never occurred to me to think of the bench. Uh, it was hard enough for a night law school graduate to get a job in those days, for, forget being a judge. But uh, along the line, uh, especially after I got to Fresno and uh, got into private press, because oh, I also became involved 
in democratic politics. And I was on the uh, Cent Democratic Central Committee for a few years and was uh, vice chairman a couple of times. So that got me in, uh, interested. And uh, somewhere along the line, the, the idea uh, began to form, well, it's a possibility. But um, when I, I, rep I was uh, co-county chairman for Jess Unruh, for governor in 1970, right, and then um, he didn't win, but uh, you know, uh, Jess Unruh was the head was the uh, head of the assembly. What do they call the the uh, speaker of the assembly. speaker of the assembly, yeah. and, and they attribute the famous remark, uh, "Money is the mother's milk of politics," to Jess Unruh. <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, he didn't win, and then uh, Jerry Brown ran '74, and I was county co-chairman for him with Sa Simon Marudian who has passed on now, but uh, was a very well-known lawyer in Fresno. And he and I uh, fl flew up to San Francisco one Saturday for um, county chairman orientation or something. And a flying back, he said, we're sitting together on the plane, of course, and uh, he said, Bob, what do you want to be, a superior court judge or, or, or municipal court judge? And I thought for a second, well, I think maybe municipal court judge is good because I want to be a superior court judge. So that's the way we went into the things. And after the campaign and Jerry won, uh, Simon got appointed superior court, God, I think, within three or four months. But uh, some other people were getting appointed to the municipal court, but I wasn't one of them. So you're starting to think maybe my, my time is passing me by here for municipal court, but <laughs> well, your, your perseverance uh, pays off, though, doesn't it, in the, well, in the end? I, absolutely. Well, at any rate, I finally said, okay, that's the way you want to play the game mentally. Uh, I called in to uh, my friend in uh, the governor's office and said, uh, listen, forget the municipal court stuff. Put me in for superior court. Two months later, I got appointed. Superior you court. were naming high enough was the problem. <laughs> right, right. You were overqualified for the <laughs> municipal court. Yeah, sure. A after taking the bench, uh, what were some of your first assignments? Uh, do you recall? Oh, God, I just remember my first one. Uh, Holly Best was um, <coughs> the presiding judge, and I'll anticipate one of your questions. If I had a mentor on the court, it was Holly Best. Uh, but at any rate, he um, assigned me some short causes, and one of them was this contest, this uh, 18, 19 year old girl from Utah, uh, this couple from Kalinga had adopted her baby and gone back to Utah and picked up the baby within a matter of a few days after birth or whatever. And uh, uh, she had signed the necessary papers, but if I remember correctly, he had a year within which you could renege on that and uh, change your mind. Well, she uh, changed her mind, and Henry Leckman was an attorney out in Kalinga, represented this, this couple who had the baby, and this uh, young woman, I've forgotten whether she even had an attorney. I, she must have. At any rate, it came up for hearing before me. That was the short cause. So uh, the law was clear. She was entitled to have her baby back. And finally, I tried to think, what am I going to do? And uh, finally, I said, well, I'm going to have to talk about this. Well, we'll say they're Mr. and Mrs. Smith with you in chambers, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And she's been holding this baby. Uh, and no one else is going to hold that baby. And I said, it's OK. Let the other young woman hold. I'll let the mother hold the baby while we're back in chambers t talking. So I got them back in chambers and uh, with, the, with their lawyer, Leckman, with their lawyer, Leckman. And, I and he was with supporting me all the way. <laughs> Henry was a good guy. He's gone like so many others, gone now too. Um, but I finally said, I have to give the baby back to the mother. And the... Uh, adoptive mother absolutely went to peace, pieces. It started crying. Uh, it was more than crying. It was just 
It was terrible. And I didn't know what to do. So and her husband is there trying to console her. And finally, we had to call the medics and take her out on a stretcher. And I was standing. This was in the new courthouse. By then, we were in the new courthouse. <coughs> and my chambers had windows looking out the, I get turned around downtown, not the north side, but the east side. So I got up, turned around, and stood and looked out the window until the medics and everyone got there with the, with the gurney and took her out. So that was my first case. Nothing like an emotional uh, start <laughs> to your uh, <laughs> Superior Court career. Uh, any particular assignments in Superior Court that you've uh, liked? Uh, I, started out well? with, I started out with family law. Ken Andreen had been the family law judge for several years, I think. And in, in the Superior well, you were there. Uh, in those days, at least, they used to rotate uh, criminal law, family court, uh, states and trust. Pretty much had a, a different uh, judge each year in those departments. They let somebody, uh, I think like when John Fitch came on, I think he wanted a states and, no, he wanted family law, didn't he? And he took that for two or three years. But that's about the way it worked. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed... Uh, well, I enjoyed uh, family law. You really get with it, and, and especially adoptions, because as I told you, I was adopted, and you know, I got great pleasure out of handling an adoption for people. It's the only thing you handle in which everyone involved is, is happy when it's over. And it's so true in family law. Otherwise, uh, there's a lot of bitterness. Yeah, there's a lot of bitterness really there. A very pleasant uh, type of order to make, certainly. And I enjoyed trials. Um, Any I, trials that stand out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> People versus Stankiewicz, the death penalty murder trial. And uh, he escaped in the middle of the trial and was gone for two days. They brought him back, and we picked up where we left off to continue the trial. And the jury uh, brought in the death penalty. He's still on death row in San Quentin, and it's been almost 30 years. Amazing. So, and it sounds like you really enjoyed uh, Superior Court. Uh, uh, did you sense, though, that there might be a window of opportunity for appointment to the Court of Appeal sometime during your uh, Superior Court tenure? I was appointed to Superior Court the same day that Pauline Hansen was appointed. And somehow Pauline and her husband Bill and Carol and I became fast friends. We traveled together. We did everything. We had a wonderful time. They're both gone now, but uh, uh, when when Pauline, who was the, uh, what do you call the chief lawyer here? The principal lawyer. The, she was the principal lawyer on the 5th District uh, from the day it was uh, created, uh, back in about 1961-62. And uh, we, as I said, we were fast friends, and uh, she told me that when she came on the Superior Court, she had been told by the then Chief Justice, Rose Bird, that just to relax, it wouldn't be long before they had her back on the appellate court. And within a year and a half or two, do you remember? Uh, I'm it guessing was, maybe a couple of years. It was, it was a couple of years, and of course she was the uh, the first woman, woman to be appointed Superior, Superior in Fresno. Court here, and well, the on, first woman on the Court of Appeal. Either one, right. municipal or superior. At any rate, we've become fast friends, and... and um, I guess we talked about it a little bit or whatever. And essentially I was saying, uh, well, you know, I'd like to be in the Superior Court a few more years. But um, in 1974, uh, Brown was, a, was elected. And uh, I went on the Superior in 77, and then I went on the Appellate in 19... December 82. Okay. Um, George Duke Mason had won the governor's office, but ha didn't take office until January 83. And somewhere back in the, during the campaign, earlier than November, Pauline had said, oh, they had, um, we're creating two new positions on the appellate court, increasing it from six to eight. She says, Bob, if you ever want to be an appellate judge, you better, file, you better put your application in now. And I took her word for it and put it in. 
And after uh, much political, uh, well, the Republicans tried to block Brown from getting the appointments so that they could have the appointments after Duke Mason took office. At any rate, uh, they didn't prevail. And the same day that I was appointed to the appellate court, Charles Hamlin, who was my former, former law partner, was also appointed. So I did thing in twos. Twos to the Superior Court, twos to the Appellate Court. And uh, now I can't remember what the point of the story was. Well, we were just trying to determine when that oppor window of opportunity oh, that's, came okay, for I'm your sorry, you're appointment right. to the Court of Appeal. And you've pretty well described that. That's how they get old. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it, because of Pauline that I went ahead and put my name in. That's and, good advice you received from her. Certainly. I would have been very happy to serve another five years on the... Uh, a superior court, and then go to the appellate court, if ever. Sure. But it, things worked out. Things worked out that way, and as you said, um, you and, and your former law partner, Chuck Hamlin, who was also on the superior court, right. were appointed right. that same day. A few months before you, uh, uh, there was an opening when Wixon Wolpert was oh, yes. appointed from San Luis Obispo County. So the three of you really joined the court very, uh, very close in time uh, in, a, in a court that was expanding uh, quite a bit with, with the two new positions. Uh, just between the, th the three of you, that would be uh, Wick, uh, Chuck, and you, uh, was there any sense of uh, competition, camaraderie, or some other way you would describe your relationships coming on the court uh, so close well, to time? Well, Wick got there about six months, four or five months maybe, before Chuck and I. And that was the point where we were outgrowing the offices over in the state building. And um, they created two new temporary well, they weren't temporary offices, but, uh, you know, uh, offices in space that wasn't intended for offices for Chuck and I just to, for us to have a chamber. <coughs> and Wick was way down at the other end of the court. So the only time you spent much time together is if you were on the same panel for oral argument or if you went down to someone's office and said, I want to talk to you about this case or that case. So uh, we were all friends. But I can't, and of course, uh, I had established this relationship with, with Pauline, um, and George Zeno was on the court, and it's always, George was always fun. Uh, so it wasn't that, you, at least that I singled out any particular one or two other than Pauline. It, it, we just sort of all came together, uh, and it was a very happy relationship. The, once, in my experience, once you took the oath, Forget the politics. From then on, you were a judge and you weren't a politician. And so politics never entered into it. Um, we had, uh, we, we weren't real social, but we were social enough so that we periodically got together and this sort of thing. It was just a very happy experience. And, and you've already mentioned that you, uh, of course, the, uh, the other two that were appointed uh, very close in time with you and you joined uh, George Zinovich and your good friend Pauline Hansen. Uh, the bench also consisted at that time of uh, presiding Justice George Brown and Associate Justice uh, Don Franzen as well as Associate Justice Ken Andreen. Uh, as part of this legacy project, uh, we are able to uh, interview Justice Zinovich and Andreen. Right. Unfortunately, the others have passed away. Right, and right. You've already told us a little bit about Pauline Hansen. Uh, is there anything you'd like to share with us about your uh, uh, working relationship with George Brown uh, and Don Franz, and starting with uh, Presiding Justice Brown. Um, one thing about George Brown, he was a great guy. So many of these people are gone, you know. Uh, that, uh, knock on wood, or find some. <laughs> uh, at any rate, you'd be on a panel with George Brown, <coughs> which as you know, and whoever ultimately listens to this might not, there's three judges on the panel, one of whom is assigned to write the opinion. Well, you'd be on a panel with George Brown. I was writing. The, I would write the opinion. You go through oral argument if they had oral argument, and I would. And at that point, I would circulate an opinion, my opinion for sign off by the other two judges. At that point, George Brown has never said a word about the case. And back comes my opinion with a dissent. <laughs> it's, uh, well, he didn't like the uh, search. So I'd walk down to George's office and I'd say, George, why didn't you say something about this? I would have modified the opinion. I think you're absolutely right. He'd say, oh, well, I didn't want to bother you or something like that. So I'd, 
oh, okay, George, so I take it back, rewrite my opinion, which meant that his dissent got tossed out, and we're all finished. Then why, why he wouldn't come down and save himself hours of work and just say, Bob, take another look at that search issue or what? <laughs> so it got to the point where I'd laugh about it. You know, I'd sign, the, I'd sign my prospective opinion and send it down to George and then wait to see how long it took to get back with a dissent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, you know, George was great. He was a wonderful leader of the court, a very bright man. And, oh, uh, yes. He uh, was, he, sometimes uh, he'd be formal, though, like you oh, said. Oh, yes, he, he was so very, the, the formality uh, of I don't like to say old-fashioned because it yeah. applies to me. <clears throat> but uh, he was very formal in that respect. And uh, he wasn't above coming down to your chambers and chatting and <laughs> gossiping a little, <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. But he was, he was a great guy. Uh, he told us a story one time. We'd all gone up to Madeira. And what was that? There was that judge up there. No, I'm sorry, Merced. We'd gone to Merced for one of these legal get-togethers in which we'd been invited. And there was a judge up there on the Superior Court who'd been there for years and years. Can't remember his name. He was well known. But George was telling us on the way back that um, when he... Uh, had not been appointed to the Court of Appeal. It's on the Superior Court in, in Kern. And they'd gone to some judge's meeting, and this judge from Merced had took him aside and said, George, don't bother putting your name in for that vacancy on the 5th District. He says, because I got it all sewed up. And uh, and George said, a month or two went by, and I got the appointment, needless to say. He says, I never miss a chance to hold it over his head to remind him of that conversation. So, and he'd laugh, you know. <laughs> Perhaps I should interject who I think that is, but that's probably Donald Fretz. It was. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't think of the name. He was a longtime uh, judge in Merced County. He's gone yeah. now, too. Yes. Uh, another person on the court at that time who later became presiding justice himself, uh, Don Franzen. Any, any thoughts about uh, Don? They all became presiding justice <laughs> except me. <laughs> <laughs> I was the token Democrat. Uh, after a while. But Don Franson, uh, well, he built this courthouse. Mm -hmm. You know, he was the presiding judge uh, during the time that uh, the legislature finally broke down and uh, voted the money, the funds to build this courthouse, and he was very instrumental and active in building it. Mm -hmm. And I think he knew, I didn't know, but I think he knew that he was going to retire a couple of years after it was finished because he really. Uh, took great pains, you know, to be uh, a part of everything that went on. He was just an, a really nice guy. Uh, he, of course, he was a Fresnan, uh, so I knew him before he became a judge, you know, way, way back uh, in the 60s when he was with uh, um, Bob uh, Sears Iani. Uh, what was the old name of the firm? Uh, Miles Sears and Yanni. Miles Sears and Franson. Well, Franson before, before Yanni. Yanni. That's right. Uh, so I just thought of Don as being a very nice guy and a friend and, and knew Irma and uh, when we would go on uh, judicial trips, uh, Carol and Irma got along very well so we spent maybe a little more time with them than maybe with somebody else. A very enjoyable experience. Uh, did you find any difficulty in your transition from uh, the trial court to the appellate court? How, how did that go for you? Well, I had sat on the appellate court for two months pro tem before I was elevated. And that, you know, two months up here is long enough for you to become acclimated, to, you know, to know generally what's going on and what's expected of you and what isn't, that sort of thing. So I, I felt it was a very easy transition. And I'm sure that's the, the primary reason why. How would you describe your judicial philosophy? Uh, I am a uh, conservative Democrat. I don't know, does that answer the question? I suppose that does. I, uh, our guys, our presiding justice, our guys never misses an opportunity to remind me that I'm uh, the lonesome Democrat, you know. But, uh, I'm a, but, but he did tell me one time, we were talking about something, and, and he said, he leaned over towards me like this and said, Bob, you were never liberal. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, when uh, you mentioned uh, Don Franzen uh, retired after a couple years, 
then in 1990, Hollis Best uh, became the PJ upon Franzen's retirement. From my vantage point, by that time I had come on the court as a junior justice, I could see that you and Holly Best uh, had a very good uh, working relationship as well as a good personal relationship. Yes. Could you share a little bit of that with us? Well, <coughs> Holly was just a joy to work with, and, and uh, he was nice enough, as I uh, related to earlier, to sort of take me under his wing when I first came to the Superior Court. And um, uh, I had only been in the Superior Court about two and a half years or so when we had a judge's meeting. We, we elected a presiding judge annually. I presume they still do, although now I've noticed that uh, they tend to have someone hold the position for two or three years, which is probably not a bad idea with the size of the court now. But at any rate, um, we were at this uh, judge's meeting, and... Uh, Somebody said, well, Holly, you're going to be presiding another year, aren't you? And he reluctantly agreed. Reluctantly. He loved it. <laughs> but at, at any rate, but then he said, I'm going to propose we do something different. And I think we ought to have a, an assistant presiding judge. Uh, you know, so uh, I have, or whoever the presiding judge is, has someone to hand things off to and makes going on a vacation a year and all this stuff. And everyone agreed that, okay, I propose that we elect uh, Judge Martin as the first assistant PJ. And he hadn't said a word to me about it or anything. I just was floored. But uh, he, was, he was my mentor. He took care of me. And he was a joy to work with. Uh, and I miss him. I do, too. I uh, agree with that entirely. Very, very intelligent, capable man. But uh, he was a, a, a people's person. You know, he, uh, George Brown, you, you, you alluded to being just sort of aloof and, and straight-laced or whatever. Well, Holly was just the opposite. You know, he, I don't think he ever met a person he didn't like. Now, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, and if, if you want to describe it in terms of uh, something about the case, but I was just wondering, are there any favorites among the cases that you authored, among the published opinions? Anything uh, that comes oh, to mind? Oh, you? yes, one case, one case. Uh, it, I went through <laughs> the cases, uh, this, the Nexus uh, list that uh, they sent me from uh, uh, San Francisco. God, you can't remember those things. Uh, but the one case I loved... Back in, get this straight now, back in about the middle uh, 1990s, some a little earlier than that, the uh, legislature had passed a new bill that gave the Superior Court the authority uh, in matters relating to judicial affairs to take over the county clerk's office, take control of it. And uh, about I'm not sure of the year, but somewhere about 1994, 1995, the Fresno County Superior Court elected to do that. I'm trying to think of the uh, then county clerk who's now on our board of supervisors. Uh, Susan Anderson. Susan. Susan about. Anderson yeah. uh, filed a lawsuit uh, to block the Superior Court from taking over the county clerk's office and she, as, as she was the county clerk. Well, the case, the case came to the Court of Appeal. Uh, they didn't have a trial or anything. It was, I guess that must have been a writ. Uh, anyway, it came to us, and Don Franson was sitting on assignment. He had retired and was coming back, came back and was sitting. A couple of judges were on vacation or something, whatever, and was working that month or for a couple of months. So Jim Ardice assigned himself, Don Franson, and me, uh, which would be the three most senior people on the court, to that case and assigned it to Don to write. Well, Don wrote an opinion uh, and uh, very uh, intelligently thought out and uh, formulated that, uh, the Supreme, that this law was unconstitutional and the uh, Fresno County Court had exceeded its uh, authority in taking over the county clerk's office and uh, issued an order uh, to revert back to the, to the original system. I wrote a dissent 
I didn't agree with any part of it. And uh, the Supreme Court took it up, and after a month or two, handed out a ruling reversing uh, France and, and uh, Ardice, and finding out I was right all along. I loved it. It was, I, was a good feeling, wasn't it? I uh, think I scorched the carpet getting from my chambers down to Ardice to tell him about it. Of course, he'd already heard. I, I remember I'm kidding when about that. It no, was, no, no. I, it was I just fun. I remember when that case came down, and, and what you've said is actually pretty close to being accurate. <laughs> but uh, I, I remember early in my uh, career on the appellate bench, I sat on the panel of a case you authored that left quite an impression on me. Uh, it was in 1989. It was the published case, uh, published, uh, case of People versus Kane. And, and as I recall, the, the factual situation was a case where uh, a law enforcement officer received a call to go to this apartment uh, where uh, there had been an attempted rape. And there was a badly beaten uh, woman that the officer found in that apartment. And while he was there, uh, he could hear loud noises in the apartment next door. And so, you know, there wasn't time really to get a warrant or anything. So. He just went on in and, and, and searched, and lo and behold, there was the perpetrator uh, in, the, in, the, in the room next door. And it, and it was a question of whether that could be justified as a, as a matter of exigency, right. that he was going to look for other potential victims or if this was a crime that was continuing in the next apartment. And uh, it, it left quite an impression on me because you uh, wrote in that opinion uh, that, uh, uh, in fact, that was an appropriate exigent circumstance to justify uh, uh, the officer's actions. Do you remember that case at all? I don't know. I, I don't I, mean to, again, put you on no, the spot. No, no. That left quite an impression. I remember it vaguely. <clears throat> I remember the part about the lady who had been raped and and, uh, and, go, and going next door and all, but getting beyond that, I really don't recall mm -hmm. it that well. Yeah, but, I, but to me, it, it was important because it uh, uh, showed that, you know, Sometimes we have to get a little bit outside of what all the published cases say. We might have a unique circumstance, and I thought that you showed the willingness to extend exigency to that kind of circumstance where someone is, is looking for other victims and a possible continuing uh, crime. Well, you can correct me on this, but uh, I think we were in, in the stage then where exigency at all was sort of a new theory that it hadn't been around for 50 or 100 years, uh, like, you know, so much of the basic law that we practiced. It was something that was still evolving and right, being for right. formulated. And, then, and so that, I thought that was a, a pretty pretty important decision. Um, so, you know, and you've already uh, you know, alluded to some of the turnover that uh, took place in the court as new people came on. By the, uh, the early to mid-1990s, in fact, there was a huge turnover in the membership of the court. And uh, you know, I, I like to say that you kind of bridged... Uh, the gap between a couple of generations on the court. Uh, would you describe any changes that you might have seen over the years in terms of the administration of the court, the processes, and, and the work environment uh, as a person that was you know, going there during these transitions? Well, uh, of course, the biggest change was we got bigger. Uh, when I went on the court, uh, Chuck and I were the seventh and eighth uh, justices. Uh, we're now, what, at 13? Uh, ten justices now. On the court now, I mean. Yeah, ten. Only ten? ten? Court. Yeah. I don't know why I thought it was more than that. At any rate, at any rate, uh, it seems to me uh, to be so much more, so much mm -hmm. more going on and everything. I'm not, I'm not putting it well, but other than that, uh, almost everyone who came on after I was was. Uh, Appointed, well, Jay Ballantyne, uh, Wiseman, um, were mostly from Fresno or people I had known in prior years, either on the Superior Court going to conferences and this sort of thing. So um, we all uh, we all seemed to blend together, fit together very well. There was no, what, I can't remember anyone ever coming on to the court where prior to his or her getting there, uh, people were saying, God, what a terrible appointment. I really can't remember that uh, ever happening, and I don't believe it ever did. They're, they're a very collegial group. And you know, you've already pointed this out. You kind of half-jokingly referred to yourself as the token Democrat. Right. And uh, 
Uh, but, you know, it's something, and, and I think you've already also uh, pointed this out, that the difference in party affiliation hardly meant you didn't get along with your cohorts. You, you did. Uh, and uh, you've always described this, this as a very collegial court. Uh, this collegiality wasn't uh, a mere matter of social collegiality, although you've already pointed out that one very important dissent that you had. Mm -hmm. Other than that, there were very few uh, dissents in cases in which you participated. Uh, to, to what do you attribute this, uh, this harmony, let's, let's call it? Well, a lot of it is uh, uh, attributable to our staffs. Uh, we have uh, 10 justices now, which means we have, not counting uh, the, uh, the group that does by the court type opinions, we have 20 <coughs> lawyers writing uh, uh, drafts and synopsis for the various justices. And um, as a result of that, you don't have 10 individual uh, judges thinking about that particular case and thinking of various alternatives, and I'm not putting this well, but it, it all comes together very well, and I think uh, we get a better work product. Do you think it's a good thing that we have career lawyers as opposed to like an annual or, absolutely. or every two years have, have clerks come in? I'm anticipating you, but absolutely. Um, and I admire the, the lawyers who, uh, who go into that career. Because I can remember one of the Supreme Court justices back about the time Marvin uh, Baxter was appointed. What was the old man on the court in those years? Uh, God, he was a Democrat, and he sat into You're his. You're thinking of Stanley Moss, I believe. Stanley Moss, right? Yeah. Um, Stanley, Mo uh, Stanley Moss had a uh, attorney assistant. And uh, Stanley must have been on the court, what, 30 years or thereabouts? A long, long time. Uh, towards the, la the last 10 or 15 years, the, the, the uh, saying was, when you read an opinion by Stanley Mosk, I challenge you to tell me whether it was written by him or his assistant. They had been together so long that they, they, they thought the same way and they even wrote the same way. And, and I think that's indicative of, of the kind of uh, work and product you get from these lawyers who take this job to heart and don't say, well, this is not a stepping stone. This is something I'm going to do for a long time, so I'm going to do it well. And uh, we're so blessed uh, to have people like that. That's so true. Um, on a bit of a, a what was a sadness for, sad note for many of us, we were all shocked and saddened a year ago when... Uh, uh, suddenly, uh, Justice Bill Stone passed away at the age of 66. Of course. Bill, Bill was a colleague of both of ours uh, who served here at the 5th from uh, 1988 to 1999. Would you share some of your recollections of Bill, mm -hmm. if, if you can? Well, Bill, Bill, Bill was a joy. He and Judge Ardice were both uh, sworn in the same day. And when Chuck Amlin and I were sworn in, um, Judge Brown said, okay, flip a coin to see who's senior this month, and then er, you change back every month. It <laughs> worked out fine, you know. But when uh, Ardice and, and Stone were uh, sworn in, um, was it Franson? Who was the PJ? Was, it wasn't. I, the, I believe Franson would have become PJ. It was very close in the time between when Brown retired and Franzen became You know, PJ. maybe Brown was still there because I thought, I thought Jim told me later on, uh, Brown told me that because of our ages that uh, Bill will be senior. <laughs> <laughs> Bill deserved to be senior. He was not that, but he, he deserved anything that he received because he was a, he was a fine person. He was, he was a fun guy. He was a fun guy. Do you have any, uh, you've already related some favorite stories on, on the court. Any other stories of your time on the court that you wish to share with us? Or have we pretty well covered uh, the ones that uh, I don't like know. to talk I, about? I, I, you know, when you try to think of those things, that yeah. they just won't come to mind. Well, I remember, well, no, that was Superior Court. When I was the presiding judge of the Superior Court, uh, before Pauline came to the Fifth, she was sitting out in juvenile, and... Um, they were building the new court section out there. 
So I was sitting in my chambers one morning without anything. Well, I had plenty to do, but without anything I wanted to do. So I was thinking, what can I do to get Pauline? So I gave her a call, and I called uh, the juvenile hall, and uh, the clerk answered the phone, and I said, this is Justice Martin, or I'm sorry, I won court ahead of myself. This is Judge Martin, and I need to talk to uh, Justice Han Judge Hansen. So, oh, oh yes, Judge, yes, we'll stop. I'll have her stop the proceeding and uh, get right on the. I thought, oh, God, all I've done now. At any rate, she came on the phone and said, Bob, Bob, what is it? I said, I want, to look, want you to look out your window. And she said, yeah, what are we looking for? I said, well, I gave an order for those carpenters out there to take the leftover lumber and build a scaffold so we can take care of these juveniles once and for all. She said, what, what? Bob, and then she said a couple words that a lady <laughs> doesn't normally utter. Uh, but that was fun day. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I never, this is the truth, I never got tired of getting up in the morning and going to work. Um, because it, every day was a challenge. And it wasn't the kind of ch challenge, you know, that was going to change your life or anything, but mm. it was interesting enough and challenging enough that I never got tired of it. Uh, and it was like that for 20 years. And, uh, I'm going to stop you just for a moment here, too. Okay. Um, so after 15 years on the court, uh, you did retire in 1997. Uh, what, what do you miss the most about uh, the court, those 15 years that you had here? Well, I, I think I miss the activity of being on the court and involved in things. After I retired, I um, worked for about six years on assignment, not 100% of the time, but the first couple of years or so I worked almost 100%, and then I cut it back so I was working maybe 25% uh, to a third of the time, sitting on assignment, and I would travel up and down the valley primarily, I spent a month in San Francisco one time and a month in Oakland, but primarily up and down the valley trying cases. And number one, it was fun to get back into the courtroom trying a case. It, it's different on the appellate court, obviously. Uh, and I missed it after being up here for 15 years. So I, that was really a joy. And, uh, and then I had a couple strokes and with the relatively good recoveries and, and that sort of ended my legal career but uh, I think I think it was just being with the people and this sort of thing my former staff and I still go to lunch three or four times a year and uh, and that's one of the exciting days for me I wake up in the morning thinking about well I'm going to go to lunch with uh, Linda and Bob and Phil you know because you know I I'm an involved person. I like to read and I like to do things, but uh, it's not like being on the court. Yeah, and I imagine uh, serving on judicial assignment uh, uh, after having been an appellate judge for 15 years, that was a little bit of a transition back to the trial court, something a little different. Oh, and they, tr they treat you like a king. But they treat you when well. When you show up in a small <laughs> court, Justice Martin, and and no one ever calls you judge. It's Justice Martin, and I say, call me Bob. <laughs> Forget it. Not going to happen. And, and that does give you a chance maybe to travel to some places you, you wouldn't otherwise go to. Did well, you find that to be uh, the Vine, not, not the Vining, what's the, the one up in the mountains where it's San Andreas? Not the most exciting place in the world, but it's fun. Mm -hmm. you, well, San Francisco, you know, was sort of fun to get back, and uh, Carol wasn't with me. But, uh, you know, at least my daughter worked in uh, Oakland, and she'd come over and have dinner. So that was sort of fun. And then I uh, got a month-long case in Oakland, a rape in concert. But that wasn't fun. But uh, it was fun being there and being able to go around and again with my daughter and go to different places for dinner and that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know. Mostly when you're... Uh, on a two or three day assignment, uh, you know, you're there, you do the work, and you come home. That's that's sort of it. Yeah, I, I imagine retirement, uh, and now that you're no longer doing assignments, is giving you time for other things. Your reading uh, would be one thing. I'm sure you're uh, you're active with, and you're, you're doing quite well too, by the way, in terms of uh, 
you talked about the strokes. You have re recovered remarkably well, Bob. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't look like no, this. Oh, come on. But I, I did want to ask you about your one of your favorite pastimes we've already alluded to, and that is cooking. Um, I don't imagine that you could possibly improve on that chili recipe of yours. <laughs> For many years, you were the perennial winner of our court's uh, chili uh, uh, contest, the, uh, the, uh, the chili cook-off. And uh, are you going to be giving away that secret recipe anytime soon uh, on your chili? <laughs> well, anyone who wants it, I'll, I'll sit down. I don't have a recipe. As you said, you're, you learned from your mom. I learned you from my mom, and I just put it together as I go along. But uh -huh. uh, I enjoy cooking. Cooking's fun, and I do enjoy eating. Uh, you know, not just the fact that... Well, that's that the fruits of your labor, right? Then. Absolutely. Okay. But... Um, uh, since I had this stroke, I have to, I have to, not hours and hours, but I have to go through a, a, a physical exercise routine. And, uh, and of course, I, I love reading, and I've, I've never not read. Uh, and, and I like watching television. There's the History Channel, uh, uh, the public broadcasting, PBS, and there's an A&E, I think it is. And, and there's uh, one or two others. I don't mean that I don't watch junk uh, like everyone else does, but my primary interest is, uh, uh, like, I love to watch the History Channel. You're watching the high-class stuff. Right? Well, well it's, not it, always. Well, it's interesting. Time. It's yeah. interesting. I was watching just the other, the other day. I can't remember what it was, which is part of my problem now. I can, you know, I can watch a program and a month later see it again. I don't remember that I've seen it. Well, that's no different than, than I, so don't worry about that. But at any rate, it was something that uh, was just interesting to me. Nothing I would ever have occasion to be involved with or do or anything like that, but it was just interesting. Developed uh, any, any new dishes in your cooking uh, repertoire or anything Oh, you know, I like, to try, I like to try different things. Um, but I, I like meat um, and chicken and, and fish to some degree. But, so I'm not, I'm not a baker pastry maker or that sort of thing. If uh, one of my favorite dishes is pot roast. You know, I, like my mother, I don't make it like my mother used to make, but I sure wish I could. Uh, but cooking, cooking is fun. Uh, I imagine you also have more time for your family. Uh, tell us about your family, starting with uh, your wife, Carol. Well, my wife, Carol, is a very interesting person. She is a uh, not as old as me, but you know, within a reasonable distance, that she still wants to be 21 and spends at least six or eight hours a day trying to accomplish that. <laughs> not true, not true. <laughs> she, she, <laughs> she puts up with me, and uh, I think we get along pretty well. We've got a dog that she says, calls the puppy from hell, that she says he's going to kill. But I protect, I protect the dog, so that's my primary uh, uh, job description. Uh, Carol is, is a good, good gal. I love her very much. And then we have our kids. Oh, I have one interesting story to tell you. Carol has a son, Rick Barstow. And uh, Rick is a real estate broker. Um, and he loves to play Texas Hold'em. And about three months ago now, he went down to Las Vegas, and with Texas Hold'em winnings he had, he bought an entry into the world's uh, Texas Hold'em tournament, $10,000. I'm impressed. Very but at any impressive. rate, uh, he played in this tournament, and uh, 8,700 and some started out. And I think they reduce it by about 50% each day. So he was in there three or four days, and it got down to where he was like the 179th person when he was uh, uh, lost uh, uh, a hand in which, uh, what do they call it when you bet all the chips you have? There's a word for it in poker. I can't I'm think. not a poker player, so I, I wouldn't be the right person uh, to give, give uh, that. <laughs> so whatever it is, at any rate, he was out. But he won forty-seven thousand dollars. Wow! Uh, based on the ten thousand he invested, that's not bad, is it? Yeah, very, very serious poker player. I'm really impressed. Yes. But uh, and Rick's Rick's a very good guy, nice mm -hmm. guy, 
And my daughter, Lisa, who is the oldest, she's a partner with Baker, Manick, and Jensen. Uh, does primary, primarily uh, uh, medical malpractice defense cases. Uh, my son, Bob, in the mill, he is a manager with Costco. He's the second man in this store up in one of the Sacramento markets. He is married, and uh, he and his wife, Judy, have my only grand grandchild, Bobby, who's just turned 12. And my daughter, Amy, who is with Cal Expo, the Cal Expo, um, Cal, uh, what is it? The safety, Cal OSHA. Uh, and she's not married up in uh, Alameda. Let's see, that takes care of everyone. And she's, but Amy's an attorney as well. With a oh, Amy is also an attorney, right. Yes. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, and again, uh, I might be putting you on the spot here once again. Uh, do you have any words of advice uh, to any new lawyers? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, just learn for a while to keep your mouth closed and listen. Um, you'll go a long ways uh, if you listen and pay attention uh, as compared to walking into an office and trying to convince them that you already know everything. Uh, other than that, I don't really think so. Any advice for new judges? Same thing. Okay. <laughs> Basically. It's pretty basic and good advice. Um, what would you like the legal community uh, and the general public to most remember about you and your work as a judge? Well, I never even thought about it. Uh, well, I hope they'll they'll remember me as as being a uh, you know a uh, reasonably nice, understanding, uh, helpful person. You, you can't always be that as a judge. Uh, you have to call them as you see them, but by the same token, uh, you don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to be crude or rude or whatever about it. And fortunately, in my experience, at least most judges are very, very well versed in, in, in the idea that uh, the people in front of them are hurting and uh, a kind word, uh, a good thought, you know, uh, never hurts. But uh, here and there, and I suppose they, some say that about me, you can get a little upset and maybe say something you shouldn't have now and then and uh, feel badly about it afterwards. Try not to do that. But as far as remembering me, I hope they'll just remember me as being a good, decent judge. Very good, Bob. I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and recollections uh, in a very candid way with us. And, and thank you also for your many years of dedicated uh, service. Thank you, Bob. Well, thank you. Event. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> All right, projects.